Well, if you would, open your Bibles with me to 1 Peter. This is our second sermon in this new series in 1 Peter. And so you may remember last week, uh, the title of the sermon was Sovereignly Saved and Secure. And I imagine, I, I hope that, um, in particular, that the secure part was, was comforting to you. Uh, because it is quite comforting to know that we are secure in our salvation. Uh, so verse 5 uh, was um, one of the verses in our text last week. It says that we, by God's power, are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Right? So we are, by God's power, being guarded through faith. And because of that, our salvation is secure. Well, this morning... Uh, we're going to see that this very faith, right, you see there in verse 5, uh, through faith, that this very faith will be tested by trials. I even mentioned last week that uh, 1 Peter has a lot to do with suffering, and so we'll begin to see that uh, in our passage today. We see that the, this faith is tested by trials, and that if genuine, that if this faith is indeed genuine, that it will be proven and purified by these trials. And moreover, it will persevere. And this is, after all, why we call the doctrine of eternal security perseverance of the saints, right? Because it is not a guarantee. This brings a little bit of balance, right? It is not a guarantee that no matter what you do, you're good. In fact, it is a guarantee about precisely what you will do, that you will persevere if you are truly born again. And that is both in faith and repentance, as they are two sides of the same coin. Now, ultimately, this is supernatural. And so we looked at that last week, right? This is the work of God, right? He who began a good work in you will complete it, right? If God began this good work in you, if you have been born again, you will persevere to the end. It will be completed through your sanctification, through your glorification. So it's supernatural. And yet we are active participants, right? We are called to persevere. We are active participants in this. And so we have to actively pursue keeping the faith, and remain in faith and repentance. And so this morning, uh, the title is, I have a good acrostic again, uh, Proven, Purified, and Persevering Faith. All right? Proven, Purified, and Persevering Faith. And so we'll begin where we left off last week in, in verse 6. And we're going to cover verses 6 through 12 this morning. Uh, but I'm going to save 10 through 12 till the end. So right now I'm just going to read verses 6 through 9. And would you stand with me uh, in honor of reading God's word? So beginning in verse 6, Peter writes, In this you rejoice. Now remember that this is our salvation, right? This salvation um, that we have been given in Christ. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. All right, you may be seated. And let us pray before we continue on. Dear God, we, uh, we thank you for this powerful passage of Scripture. And we pray, Lord, that you will give us insight as we look at this together, Lord. Um, guide me as I preach. And we pray, Lord, that by your Spirit that you will um, illuminate our hearts, Lord, that you will um, inspire us. Uh, to persevere in the faith, and that our faith will be proven and purified. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so um, we see in this passage that that Paul, or sorry, Peter, I might do that a lot. It's just easy just, just, to, just to go back to Paul, right? Uh, this is Peter. We see in this passage that Peter, um, he uses gold as, as an illustration. I have a I have a little uh, piece of gold right here. It might just look like a speck to you, but it cost me a little bit of money. Um, I, I went I went through this phase 
uh, years ago where I was collecting coins. Of course, this isn't a coin, but I didn't I did buy this at a coin store. And it, it's kind of cool because it's, it's, it's just a raw gold nugget. Uh, I think it was mined in California, I don't remember for sure. Um, but it's uh, just, just a little gold nugget and uh, I don't know, it's kind of neat. But, um, but Paul, Peter, uses gold as, as an illustration in this passage. And, and he makes a parallel and a contrast with our faith, right? So he's, he's making a parallel with our faith and a contrast with our faith. So the parallel is this. Peter says that genuine faith, like gold, is proven and purified by fire, by trials, right? You see that parallel? So, so you think of the refining process of gold and how um, gold is, is put, put through the fire and, and the impurities come out. And so it purifies it, but also it's, it's, it's showing that it is true gold, but remains there, right? There, there's, there's a um, proving and purifying that takes place. So genuine faith, like gold, is proven and purified by trials, but the contrast is that genuine faith, unlike gold, it does not perish, right? Now, we might think that, oh, well, you know, my gold's not going to perish, but all things on this earth will perish, right? All things will in the end, but not, not our faith. Genuine faith, unlike gold, it does not perish, and thus it is far more precious, right? Peter says that it is more precious than gold. Gold's a pretty precious thing. He says our faith is even more precious, and that's namely because it does not perish, okay? So we'll look at the parallel first, but before we do that, let's talk a little bit about trials, because here in verse six, Peter says, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So what are these trials? Well, for, for the original audience, uh, we know that, that they were facing persecution. And remember, uh, this is a general letter written to people dispersed in many different places. And, uh, and, and they were, in fact, facing persecution. Uh, persecution far greater than, than any of us are facing right now. However, uh, you very well may be facing some kind of minor persecution. And, uh, and Jesus says that, you know, blessed are the persecuted. That's something that... Um, we can even rejoice in because we know that we're actually living out our faith and that, uh, and that God is going to work through this trial, right? So persecution, um, that may be a trial that you're facing. Uh, certainly we all should suffer or sacrifice in some way for our faith, right? We don't become Christians so that everything can just be wonderful. Uh, there are sacrifices that are required of us, right? Take up your cross and follow me, says Jesus. And so there's going to be some suffering involved there, whether it's persecution or something else. So that could be our trials. Uh, we could even broaden it, though. Trials might come in forms of, of illness, uh, maybe a rough marriage, financial stress. And we could go on and on and on and, and think of different trials that we might face. It's helpful for us to understand that um, in the New Testament, uh, there, there are a couple of words that actually translate the same Greek word. So trials and temptations, right? Um, they're actually translating the same Greek word. So why is it that in most of our English translations, uh, we have two different words that are used at different times to translate the same Greek word? I think, I think that uh, a, a good reason for this is that um, whenever this word is translated trials, it's, it's helping us to identify how it is being used. So, for example, um, in James, count it all joy when you face trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Right, so that's, that word trials is the same word that in other places is translated temptations. But this is being used in a, in a good way, right? Count it all joy when you face trials of various kinds. Kinds, for we know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. That's actually very similar to what Peter's saying here in First Peter, isn't he? And so, so this is this is this usage in a more positive sense. And Peter, um, Peter is saying that trials can and should work for our good. Right? Trials can be a good thing for the Christian. Indeed, trials prove and purify. Our faith, right? Coming back to this whole analogy with, with the gold. 
And yet there is a danger. There is a danger that our trials can also tempt us to sin, that they can become temptations to sin. And that's a bad thing, right? So we think of the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation. Same word, same word, but it's used in a different way, isn't it? And, and so, so temptation to sin is a bad thing. Right? So trials can be used for good, but they can become temptations to sin. And, and, uh, and that's something that we have to be very, very mindful of. And we, and we ought to pray this often, right? We ought, we ought to pray, um, as we're instructed in the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation. I wonder, though, how much more often some of us pray, deliver me from this trial, than we pray, deliver me from temptation. Have you thought about that? How, how much more often we pray, deliver me from this trial, than we pray, deliver me from temptation or lead me not into temptation? We're concerned more with comfort than we are with holiness. That's something that we ought to repent of. We, 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 we should not be more concerned with our comfort than with holiness. And so we can embrace trials and and, and seek, seek to be sanctified through them, and at the same time pray that they, don't become, that they don't become a temptation to sin. Now, it's not wrong to ask for deliverance from trials. I mean, we do that every time we pray for someone who's sick, right? We're asking them to be delivered from their sickness. However, maybe a better way to pray, though, is, is to ask that in the midst of their sickness, that God can, can, can work in them in a special way. Because we see that God works through our trials. And so we can pray for deliverance, but our greatest desire should be that in the meantime, as we go through these trials, that our faith might be proven and purified. Look at verses 6 and 7 again. In this, rejoice, in this you rejoice, that is, in this salvation you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And that is what it's all about, right? Praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Right? We move on in verses 8 and 9. It says that uh, we rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your salvation, of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Right? And so, and so we, we look forward to this salvation that is promised to us. And, and when we, we go through the trials and we recognize that we are being proven and purified through them. And so uh, we've already said a lot about this, but uh, I guess now we'll officially jump into this first, um, this first point. That genuine faith is proven and purified by trials. Genuine faith is proven and purified by trials. So, notice there in verse 7, the tested genuineness of your faith. So, here's a question we can all ask ourselves. Do trials prove the genuineness of my faith? Or do they do the opposite? How do you respond when you face a trial? Does it prove the genuineness of your faith or does it do the opposite? When you face persecution, when you face illness, a rough marriage, financial stress... How does your faith hold up? Do you keep your trust in Jesus and remain committed to follow his example and his teachings? Or do you lay him aside and do you go your own way? Right? It's easy, it's easy for us to say, I have faith in Jesus when everything is going fine. But the real test, the real test is when you face trials. Think of a man from my home church that I grew up in in Texas. You can't make this stuff up. I mean, this, this guy has gone through so much in the past five years. Five years ago, his son killed himself um, about, about my age. At least we think he killed himself. We don't even know for sure. Um, uh, there was no note, right? So, you know, it was suggested, well, maybe he was cleaning his gun. But probably wasn't the case because he, he, had, he had gone through all kinds of struggles beforehand. And so there were some some warning signs, but there was no note or anything like that, um, which I don't know, maybe that makes it even worse. But uh, I mean, goodness, whatever the case, he, he lost his son and, and, and uh, how terrible is that, uh, especially at such a young age. 
The following year, just a year after his son had died, he was in a, in a very, very bad car wreck with his wife and his wife's parents. His wife and her parents both died, they all died. He lost his wife and his in-laws in that wreck. And then he uh, had significant injuries from that wreck as well. So his son, his wife, his, his in-laws. And then, uh, of course, this led to, he had to close uh, the catering business that he loved so much that he and his wife had, had run for many years um, because of her death and I think also because of injuries that, uh, that he had uh, sustained. The year after that, his granddaughter died of SIDS. And uh, this was all in the midst of dealing with his daughter's drug, drug addiction. Um, maybe he had about a year of peace after that, but then in this, just in this past year, he was diagnosed with stage four cancer. And then he had a massive heart attack. Um, I mean, goodness gracious, how can a person sustain that? That kind of thing is either gonna make you or break you. If that is not being tested by fire, I don't know what is. And yet this man, this man, his faith is, is stronger than ever. Um, and uh, God has worked wonders in him. Now I wanna make a note here. When we talk about these kinds of trials, it's not as if God is up in heaven saying, Okay, let's, let's see how he's going to respond to this. And let's see how he's going to respond to this. He's not up there indifferent to our suffering and just, just seeing, okay, what's going to make him break? That's not what we should imagine when we think of God using trials to test us. God cares very deeply about our suffering. He cares so deeply that he sent his son, Jesus, to suffer the penalty of our sin. And one day he's going to come, he's going to make all things right. right? Because of Jesus' death and resurrection, we have this promise that when Christ returns and all who trust in him, that we will be raised to new life and, and, and we will live on a perfect new creation for all eternity. All things will be made right. All wrongs will be set straight. God promises us that. But in the meantime, he uses suffering to sanctify his children. Um, you know, we live in a fallen world. Uh, the reason this world is so messed up is because of sin. And, and God is, is uh, so sovereign that he is even able to use sin and all kinds of terrible sufferings to conform us back into the image of his son. Right? Remember, we were created in the image of God. Male and female, he created them in his image. And of course, we still bear that image, but that image is, is, is shattered, it's twisted, it's, it's, it's perverted. And so, so, so for those who are in Christ, what, what's, what's happening is that image is, is being formed and, and perfected. We're being conformed into the image of God's Son, what we're told in, in Romans chapter 8. And that hurts sometimes, right? I, I, think, of, I think if you're, try, you're trying to shove something to fit it into a mold, right? It, it hurts. It hurts. Um, or... Here in 1 Peter, you know, being tested by fire, right? Fire hurts. Our trials, they, they hurt. But that's kind of necessary. And God is able to redeem those things and, and use them uh, for our good and for his glory. So he uses suffering to sanctify his children. And that is essentially what the testing of your faith is. Will it sanctify you? Will it purify you? Or will it show you to be a sham, right? Whenever you face these trials, are, 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 you, are, you, gonna, are you going to toe the line and keep the faith and, and, and follow Jesus' commands? Or are you going to go your own way? And are you going to lose the faith? Of course, that would show that um, perhaps... Your faith was not genuine to begin with because uh, we're talking about perseverance of the saints, right? Uh, and we'll talk about that more explicitly as we get to the next point. But, but this, all, this all kind of fits together, right? If you're being proven and purified through your trials, um, you're going to persevere as you face those trials. And that's going to show 
uh, that you that you have been born again and that God has began a good work in you and that he is completing that work in you um, but what does what does John say in first John about those who 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 leave who have left the church he says they went out from us because they were never really of us All right and so we see in their case that uh, they had a a false faith that they were in fact a sham and so Will the testing of your faith, will it sanctify you, will it purify you, or will it show you to be a sham? Now, of course, we're all going to stumble and fall, and, 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 and we, we all struggle with sin. But that's, that's actually kind of the question. The question is, are you struggling with your sin, or have you just completely given in to it, right? This, this, the struggle, the struggle is, is, is a good thing, right? We ought to be struggling against it as, as, we, as we seek to be sanctified. By the power of God's Spirit. One key thing to this passage, I've already mentioned that this proving and purifying and persevering, they all kind of go hand in hand, and we especially see this with the proving and the purifying. They go hand in hand. Um, I want to show you a, a, a different Bible translation uh, compared to the ESV to bring some things to light. So I'm reading from the ESV, uh, but uh, uh, here on the screen, the, the, first, the first one is from the Christian Standard Bible. And so this is verse um, 7, right? So, so we go through trials for what purpose? So that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which though perishable is refined by fire, may result in the praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now that, um, that translation actually kind of fits better my points in my sermon, right? The proven character of your faith. Now, of course, the, the ESV fits it as well, but uh, this actually uses the same word that I'm using, right? Your, your faith is proven through these trials, right? So the proven character of your faith. And you see the other bold word there is refined by fire, right? Refined or purified. That's kind of the same thing, right? Uh, refining is you're taking out the impurities. So that might actually fit better the, uh, uh, the points that I'm making. And I, I think that that translation is helpful, but that translation actually does miss something. It misses something um, in the original language. So I want you to look at uh, the, the next translation in ESV. It says, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So you see the bold words there, and the second one is tested genuineness, and then tested. Now I think the translators must have been very intentional here in the ESV to use the same word, because it's actually the same Greek word behind these bold words. So if we go back to the CSB, proven character, refined, it's the same Greek word, just a different form, okay? But that is, you can't really see that in the English there in the CSB. And so the ESV, I think, makes a point to show that, okay, this is actually the same word, tested genuineness, tested. And so what that shows is that this proving, this purifying, that they do, in fact, go hand in hand. It's, it's, it's almost one and the same, right? If, if you are purified by your trials, if your faith is purified, then it is proving that your faith is genuine, right? And so I think that's a very helpful insight. The lesson is that the purifying is, in large part, the proving. And so for the true believer, trials will ultimately refine and reveal a genuine faith in Jesus. Trials will refine and reveal a genuine faith in Jesus. So that leads us to the second point. Um, genuine faith perseveres, right? Genuine faith perseveres. Now, I've already said uh, much on this in the introduction, so let me just highlight again where we see this in the text. So in verse 7, there's a lot packed in here in verse 7, so that's really where we're spending most of our time. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to neglect um, some of what we see there in verses 8 and 9. But in verse 7, um, I noted that there's a parallel and a contrast that are made. Um, right? So, so the, the parallel... Remember, was that genuine faith, like gold, is proven and purified by trials. The contrast is, which we also see in verse 7, is that genuine faith, unlike gold, does not perish and is thus far more precious.
precious. You see that more precious than gold, though it perishes, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire. Um, genuine faith, unlike gold, does not perish and is thus far more precious. In other words, a genuine faith perseveres, right? It doesn't perish, it perseveres. And so um, that is the guarantee for those who have been Verse 3, born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Those who have been born again, as it says in verse 3, um, will have this genuine faith. And it will persevere. There's nothing like uh, the funeral of, of a believer who has persevered to the end. Right? Of course, funerals are sad, and it's a time to, to mourn a loss. But, but when a person has lived a long life and they've been faithful to the Lord... Um, that's, there's something really encouraging about that, right? This person has persevered to the end. Um, Emily's grandfather's funeral was like this. We, we went to her grandfather's funeral just, I don't know, maybe about a month ago now. And uh, he was a minister throughout his life. And, um, and uh, then into his retirement years, he, he persevered. And, and, and you could just see a, a love for the Lord. Um, he never, you know, as, as he got old, he never got uh, he never got cranky and bitter, but he had this he had this sweet spirit about him, and and uh, and he he just really loved the Lord, and um, he uh, he suffered a uh, really bad stroke years ago, and so he ended up in a nursing home, and um, and so uh, you could see him just going downhill. It was kind of sad to see, um, but yet he he still had this joy in the Lord, and I remember. You know, every time we'd go and visit him, he would, he would ask about the church. He would ask about our Sunday school numbers and you know, all that kind of stuff. And, um, and, and he, uh, he said that he was praying for us um, and, uh, and, and very, very encouraging. And, and when he finally did pass, um, his, his funeral was a testimony to his perseverance. And so that's, that's something to praise God for, right? Uh, that, um, this perseverance to the end. Of course... Uh, not all live so long, though. And uh, I was thinking, thinking about uh, the secret church simulcast that uh, some of us uh, watched together on Friday night from 6 p.m. to 12 p.m. We were here in the church watching uh, six hours of teaching um, from, uh, from David Platt. And uh, one, of, one of the most memorable parts for me was whenever he was sharing about um, some of these martyrs for the Christian faith um, who, had, who had stood on principle and um, you know, were, were standing on, on the uh, truth of justification by faith alone and things like that. And, and they were burned at the stake. And, 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 and they, they went to the stake with, with, with courage and with joy, praising the Lord, even as they were being burned alive. Some were, were even put into sacks and thrown into the water and drowned in a sack. I don't know which would be worse, but those are both quite, quite terrible. And yet they, 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 had, they had something within them that allowed them not only, not only to persevere, but, but with, with, with courage and with joy, with conviction to, to die praising the Lord and proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's pretty incredible. Um, how's that for persevering? Genuine faith perseveres. And, and, and there is something supernatural about it, right? Uh, J. Oswald Sanders says, The perseverance of the saints is only possible because of the perseverance of God. So this goes back to what we talked about last week. That it is, it is, it is God who is, who is holding us fast. It is God who is securing our salvation for us in heaven, who is guarding us in his power through faith. And yet we are active participants, right? We, we, have, these, we have these commands to, to persevere. In fact, I quoted this verse last week, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Right? So that's something that we are to do, right? We are to work out our salvation. And what that means, I, I think that's talking specifically about sanctification, because our justification is in the past, right? If you are in Christ, you have been justified, you have been declared righteous before God, and that's, that's, that's a past event. But now, um, we have to remember that salvation is a package deal. 
Uh, there's justification, sanctification, glorification. And so right now we're in this journey of, of sanctification, becoming more and more like Christ. And that's also a supernatural thing. But this is one thing that we do have a part in. And, 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 that's, and that's, that's what our whole Christian life is, right? We're pursuing holiness. We're pursuing Christ. And we're doing that in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we're being sanctified. Right? So we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work his good pleasure. It almost sounds contradictory, right? Um, I, I, I refer to this verse so often. Not only did I refer to it last week, but I've referred to it in Sunday night teachings. And maybe you're getting tired of it, but I, I, I think it really encapsulates um, what this whole Christian life is about, right? That we have our responsibility to work out our salvation, and yet ultimately it is God who is doing this work. And so you might say that, that our perseverance is evidence of a work of God. In our heart, right? Uh, the, the, the proving and purifying of our faith is evidence that it is genuine. It's evidence that God has done a work in our heart, that we really are born again. The perseverance is evidence that God is working in us, that we are um, truly saved, that we have a genuine faith. And so we, we, we work out the salvation with fear and trembling. And again, um, I wish we could spend more time in verses 8 and 9 here. Um, but, uh, but we see in verses 8 and 9 that um, we have this joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. And so, and so that we might obtain the outcome of our faith. Uh, salvation of our souls. We need to press on to verses 10 through 12. And what I'm going to do, I'm just going to read these verses and make a few comments on them. And we're going to transition to the Lord's Supper. Um, so we have the great privilege of taking the Lord's Supper together this morning. So we have not yet read verses 10 through 12. So listen carefully or read along with me if you would. Uh, verses 10 through 12. Concerning the salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, and the things that have now been announced to you through those who who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Now those few verses are kind of wordy, so maybe it was a little bit confusing to you. It's actually quite simple, though. Uh, this is celebrating this great salvation that we have in Christ, this great salvation that we are about to celebrate in a very special way through the Lord's Supper. And we're told that this, this salvation that we know, that we know fully. The, the prophets before us who prophesied about Christ coming, they, they only saw it in part. Right? They, 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 were looking, they were looking from a distance. And the angels, even now, they long to look. They long to experience what it is to cross over from lost to found, from death to life, from darkness to light, to the saving work of Jesus. Isn't that incredible? Have you, have you ever thought about that? Even, this, this, this is even more incredible than thinking about, you know, okay, the prophets, these holy men of God, they, saw, they, they only saw it from, from, from far off. But even, even the angels, even the angels now, they long to look, they long to experience or to know the salvation that we know. Because angels, they, 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 they didn't need to be saved, Right? Um, except those who, <laughs> who fell, uh, who don't want to be saved. Uh, there is no hope for them. But, uh, but the angels in heaven, um, they, uh, they didn't need saving. And, and, and because of that, um, they actually have missed out on knowing God in, in, in a way that we know God. That is, while we were still enemies of God, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I mean, isn't that one of the things that inspires us so much to worship and to love God and to recognize how incredible he is? Because while we were his enemies, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
the angels, well, that didn't happen for them. They didn't need it. And so, and so they, they long, they long to look, they long to know what we know, to experience God in the way that we experience God. That's pretty incredible. And so as we take the Lord's Supper this morning, that's something that we can reflect on, um, how incredible it is that Christ died for us.